God, I hate group texts. I don't need to see laughed at an image. I don't need to see LOL. And Matt is the worst fucking person about that. And he knows I hate group texts. We're in a group text with a bunch of friends and we'll, you know, we share inappropriate things because we don't want it on Facebook. Like my phone's blowing up at seven o'clock in the morning and I think something's going on with, with my guys or something. So I go look at my phone and it's one meme and like 15 LOLs. I'm like, you mother... You're listening to Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong. Welcome to episode 188 of the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. I'm Dave Roberts. With me is journalist, writer, owner of the Georgia Virtue, Jessica Salagi. Hello, Dave. How are you? Where do you get like like an applause track when I announce you? I agree. Or like cheers. Or booze, either way. Uh, Rude. Well, no, I, I'm going off the, the mean tweet that you shared or the mean message you shared uh, last week. About that, if you don't have kids in school, you should keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Well, it was like, the you know, the, if you don't live here, like as if the internet does not cross county lines. Our corrupt is our own. What's entertaining to me is like, I mean, of course, the people who send these messages never, they never think, the, the reason they're sending those messages is because they're the closed-minded people that think, you know, our stuff should stay here and all that. But like then the media by default does not, the local media is, is, is part of the problem in most small towns because they don't report the hard hitting stuff. And that's why the places can't improve because nobody knows about it or it's taboo to talk about it. So they just don't. They call well, me a that, brainless twit, which I really, I really enjoyed that. Twit, huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think there's supposed to be an A in there. No, that's not appropriate. <laughs> well, I mean, if you can insult somebody, don't call me a twit. Uh-huh. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's funny. Like, you just, you just keep your, your nose out of our business down here. If we want our school board to be corrupt, that is our prerogative. I love that that's your um, imitation of not only South Georgia, but in particular Bryan County, because Bryan County is Richmond Hill, which is like rich people and transient people. And so I'm really enjoying that. That's I, they're going to be you're going to get the hate mail next week. <laughs> <laughs> that's my Southern Karen. It's excellent. <laughs> well, it reminds me of the DOT commercial or whatever it was. It was a pothole. Go, oh, no. We popped your tire again. Mm-hmm. No, that's my Paulding County voice too. I mean, it's, it's pretty much everywhere, but inside 285. Right. <laughs> but yeah, I, I love that you share your mean tweets and, and your mean emails. It is awesome. Uh, it just, it, it totally takes the power away from them too. It's like, okay, well, this is my opposition. The, most of the time I don't, share who it is because i did get put in facebook jail for that and and i don't want them to get like i mean i know that it sounds silly but like i don't want them to get nasty messages from my people i'd rather my people just well your audience is a lot larger than that person's Mm -hmm. but there's one thing about like when someone doesn't know who it is and they're commenting and saying um you know what an idiot or that was a stupid thing to say or hot like just whatever or a funny gif but it's totally different for me to out somebody and then them receive even a handful of nasty messages like that's not productive so yeah but you can unleash the facebook dogs on anybody you want to (laughs) well i I mean you you, you've i've seen you do it mm -hmm. in a group text with uh with a a low like all right do your thing well yeah if somebody you know i think that was on a something where if it's not on my page and like some but it's somewhere where i can like that was i think when you're in your your little paulding county nonsense too ah could be 
And we do have a lot of nonsense in Paulding County. Well, I got kicked out of the group. Yeah. They yeah. Don't play there. They, they don't let me play on that playground. You can read it, but you can't play. Because <laughs> right. you, you're not from here. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so did you enjoy the colder weather last week? Man, I froze my butt off. Uh, I, I told you before we started recording, I left the house. It was, you know, 55, 56 degrees. And I was just wearing a short sleeve shirt, which is fine. And I had to go to the top of Mountain and Jasper to to do a job. And it was 48 degrees and windy. And of course, my moisture wicking uh, polo shirt that I wear didn't offer much protection. I'm sure not. But yeah, it was it was it was chilly, it was chilly. But uh, when, as as I got up to to record, it was like sixty seven in the house, which I like. I, I like my my I like to be cooler when I sleep and stuff like that. But it, it fall it, this is the false fall. We'll be back in the eighties nineties, you know, in October, mm-hmm. or we'll have a foot of snow. We better because it's because it's Georgia. We know I don't like winter, so I won't, I won't, I won't rehash. Why I know you so freaking horrible, but sun's out, guns out. Yeah, everybody's happier when you're tan. Absolutely. So we have U.S. Attorney's Office FBI examining Screven County death. Right. So last week we talked about the march to the sea from Sylvania to Savannah. Um, the family of. Julian Lewis and his attorneys and Brooke Bacon and all of them. And so, of course, the day the show dropped, they arrived in Savannah. And I just want to go on, like, publicly say I don't think that they walked the entire way. Because on Thursday and Friday and Saturday, I think, like, they started early and showed them walking 12 miles all day. And then on Sunday, they started after lunch, after church. And on Monday, they were there by, like, lunchtime. So, and they said they were walking 12 miles a day. So, if it took you, I mean, it just doesn't add up. But I'm not surprised by them being dishonest about it. But anyway, they finally arrived in Savannah. And um, the weather was horrible. It was, like, torrential downpours. And they stood outside the... um U.S. Attorney's Office and chanted and marched more and held signs and and kneeled in the rain and held fists in the air. And um, later that afternoon, the U.S. Attorney's Office put out a press release saying, um, well, they just said the Southern District of Georgia's U.S. Attorney's Office is is in consultation with the FBI about the August 2020 death of Julian Lewis in Scriven County. In accordance with U.S. DOJ policy, no further information on this matter will be publicly disclosed unless or until a determination is made to pursue federal prosecution. And so, of course, like the media headlines went wild about how now the U.S. Attorney's Office is um, investigating this matter. But I had somebody reach out to me who... uh, has ties to a, f- a federal office that would investigate these types of things. And I was told that um, basically, like, this is something that they do for all officer-involved shootings anymore, you so- and it's specifically when somebody dies because they have become so politicized. And so for, I guess, several years now, the DOJ and the FBI have uh, – most of the time it's pretty quiet because we don't even hear about it. They just review the evidence and then close it out. Um, so – basically like they were already doing this and they decided that they would put out the press release to quell the the chanters out in the street the reason i have a problem with that is because now you have emboldened them and and most people don't know what i just told you and they're not going to go on the record and say that because that's not politically popular and so now they think that their 63 mile march in the middle of the road was monumental and impactful so now we have to listen to that <sighs> the fbi investigates every officer involved shooting or just officer involved shooting that is interracial um my understanding is that like 
they don't they don't go just investigate. They once they they basically review the evidence that the state has or the district attorney. They review that same evidence. Um, they're not like going and interviewing witnesses and stuff unless they decide to probe further. But they look at you know the reports that are toxicology reports, um, incident reports, statements, transcripts, things like that, and and review based on that and decide of course you know most of the time we like I said we don't even hear about it because they don't just stick their nose in and and decide to do anything unless it's particularly egregious well it's a state matter first of all it is uh, a grand jury has already reviewed the facts and correct me if I'm wrong but a grand jury does not have to be unanimous no just a majority Right, so you have 12 people. Nope, 22. 22, I'm sorry, 22. So it takes 12 of 22 to say, yes, there, there's enough evidence to indict. Mm-hmm. That's not a conviction, just to indict. Uh, and those 22 people decided that there was not sufficient evidence to indict this guy. So we get these people throwing a temper tantrum, and the FBI decides to pop up, and DOJ decides to pop up, and go, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. We're taking a look at it. Please, don't walk. Do anything but walk. Oh, and, oh, kneeling? Oh, oh, Lord. They're kneeling now. We better look at this. Their fists are in the air? Oh, my God, this is awful. Release a statement. I mean, you're being sarcastic, but that's pretty much what happened. No, I'm, 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 I'm using a little bit of hyperbole, but that's exactly what happened. And that's what's not the, how the system is supposed to work, which is why it's just so disgusting to me. What's the worst thing you could do to, for a two-year-old that's throwing a temper tantrum in the grocery store? Pick them up and love on them and give them what they want. Go and grab that toy or the, the box of cereal they want and go ahead and put it in the cart and go, okay, honey, Freaking just be leave quiet. them at the grocery store and come back the next morning is what you should do. Parenting advice <laughs> from Jessica Salaji. Leave them at the store. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I wouldn't go quite that far. That'll teach him. But you don't give in. No. And I'm not saying... If they're going to do this behind the scenes anyway, fine. But you don't release a statement just to pacify a bunch of people throwing a temper tantrum. Well, especially when you don't release these statements on all the others. Like, this is the only one... Savannah... uh, our, the FBI office where Screvin is in, um, it's in Statesboro because it's like a regional thing, obviously. But the U.S. Attorney's Office is in Savannah. So, I mean, but the U.S. Attorney's Office would oversee all the officer-involved shootings that have come out of Savannah, which is a lot more than anywhere else. And they don't put these statements out. So by doing a standalone thing, you, you just embolden these attorneys and they they think it's a victory. And it's just, it's gross. It is. Look, I want the DOJ, I want law enforcement, and I want the entire judicial branch to be separate, to be above political pressure. Ha. Huh. They should be. You know, they're supposed to go by the rule of law, period. As we discussed before, we all believe that Casey Anthony killed her daughter, but... It was not proven at trial. Therefore, she is not guilty. It was not proven at trial. There, some things slip through the cracks, but we have to protect individuals' rights. Mm -hmm. But this didn't even get that far. You couldn't even indict after how much, tons of testimony before the grand jury. They still did not have anything to indict the guy. So regardless of what you think of the shooting, he was not indicted. You know, protesting everything else should not change that fact. And the fact is, we've gotten such a uh, social media uh, hyper-political age that the Justice Department is going to bow to 50 people marching, marching from from Sylvania downtown to Savannah. 
doing 12 miles a day. I mean, hell, golfers do, uh, professional golfers do more than that in a, uh, in a tournament in the weekend. That's hyperbole too, I know. Hell, the caddies do it carrying a bag. I just, uh, it's just disgusting. And all it does is it, these attention whore attorneys that run around, and I can't remember what, what the, what the, uh, the attorney is that runs out on every race thing. I obviously I know glory raw all red that runs around on every, uh, Ben Crump, Ben Crump. That's it. Ben Crump. He is an attention whore. He, I mean, he racks up those freaking flyer miles, buddy. Oh, somebody was uh, uh, shot during a robbery? What was his race? White guy. Ah, oh, let that one go. Oh, black guy was killed. Team, assemble. Let's hop on our flight. Let's go. Well, and this wasn't the only... So that was on Monday of last week. And then on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we were supposed to have the immunity hearing for the Marcus Wilson case, which I don't know if it... I mean, it's been a really big deal down here because it happened in Statesboro. And then, of course... Like, so that means it kind of permeates across the media market and it's gotten some national attention because of the attorneys. Um, so I don't know if you've heard about it or, and I don't remember if we've talked about it on the show, but, um, basically like the short summary of the case is there was, um, an incident on in the middle of the night, um, last June in 2020 and between, um, a car with five, um, white teenagers, in it Wait, five people together in June of 2020? Yes. Were they masked? I, I <laughs> from what I understand, <laughs> no. And then there were, um, Marcus Wilson and his girlfriend were in another car. Be- and there was an incident that occurred. It was like some road rage stuff. Um, and the rest of the facts are up for dispute right now. But essentially what happened is um, at some point the situation escalated and uh, Marcus Wilson fired a number of shots and one of them went through the back window and hit the middle passenger in the back row in the head and killed her. She was 17. And so Marcus has been charged with felony murder and a number of aggravated assault charges and, you know, felony or having a firearm and commission of felony and all that stuff. Um, so he was, he was, he's black. He's actually, um, his mother is white and his father is black. So adds another interesting dynamic to it. Um, but the guys in the other car were white and they have said that he was yelling racial, they were yelling racial slurs at Marcus. And so, and like running him off the road. And so he fired the gun in self-defense, but he was behind them obviously because he shot into the back window and his girlfriend who, um, or his girlfriend at the time, she's white. And, um, she said she didn't hear any racial slurs. So, I mean, it's just like this big convoluted thing. However, even even if they did, uh-huh. even if they did, you don't. Sh- you one, can't you shoot don't someone sh- because they call you names. Right. Uh, you also don't shoot through the back glass at somebody. Also, even if they're trying to run you off the road, hit your brakes, let them go or hit your accelerator and get past them. Whatever it is, separate yourself from the situation. The, you know, the the wisest thing is hit your brakes, uh, get their tag number if if they're driving erratically, and call nine one one. You don't shoot through the back glass. And, no, and but that's and, not really like. I mean, there's like a million different ways that it could have gone differently. Um, and he he left the area, and they didn't go to the police, and the girl went to the hospital. Obviously, was pronounced dead. And he was arrested a few days later. Um, but they the 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 crux of it is that the attorneys have claimed that it's self defense and he should be immune from prosecution because there's no duty to retreat and stand your ground and all this, which is an interesting element given like the stuff that's happening with Ahmad Arbery and things that we have um like the way that our laws have changed with citizen arrest or you know, optically changed. We know that they didn't really actually change, but just all these different things. And then of course the trooper in Scriven County, well, the same attorneys for the family of Julian, Julian Lewis, Francis Johnson and Maui Davis and all these and their friends are representing Marcus Wilson. So in Scriven County, where it was unacceptable for 
um, the trooper, Jacob Thompson, to defend his life against someone in a vehicle. And he was out of the vehicle. Here, it's supposedly self-defense because he shot an unarmed female who was in front of him driving away. So they had this immunity hearing. It was on Wednesday. On Thursday, there was an incident with um, some evidence and a binder. Um, It's another convoluted story, but comes down basically to a mistake on the part of the assistant to the judge. Like the assistant was supposed to give a binder to somebody. He was supposed to give it to the prosecutors. He gave it to the defense. The guy's kind of a ding dong anyway. So, I mean, it's not a, Un, I'm not surprised that this happened. And I was actually in the courtroom when it happened. Like, not a lot of people were there yet because the day hadn't started. But I watched the entire thing unfold. And so later on during the hearing, it was going horribly for the defense. Like, their key witness was really just not offering much testimony that would indicate that Marcus Wilson, Wilson should be immune from prosecution. And Things start escalating and the judge, they bring up this binder and the judge orders the attorney, Francis Johnson, to hand it over and he refuses and holds on to it like he's holding, like a toddler holds a toy when you tell him to give it to them. And um, basically he was escorted out um, for contempt of court and held in a cell for most of the morning and into lunch. We were supposed to come back at two o'clock to resume and his, all the attorneys filed paperwork to have the judge removed from the case because, you know, it's never the attorney. It's never Francis Johnson's fault that something is going, you know, not the way that they wanted or that he shouldn't have like that. He should have just given the binder to the, the bailiff to give to the judge to give to the clerk that there was a process in place and that this was all happening in front of everybody it's not like it was happening behind closed doors and nobody would see what occurred I mean there was a video camera there for crying out loud so it's not Francis's fault though it's the judge's fault so now they want him removed from the case they want him removed from the contempt hearing overseeing that and um the Immunity stuff came to a screeching halt. And instead of talking about Marcus Wilson, who's facing life in prison for felony murder, we're talking about Francis Johnson and the hero that he is because he fought the system yesterday. He fought the law and the law won. Look, I hate contempt of court, the charge. Mm -hmm. But in this case, and look, there's, there's nothing in that binder that, he couldn't have. The binder contained jail emails, and it was supposed to contain school records that were obtained in an in an interesting way, which is another discussion for another day. But it was supposed, and and I don't know if anyone has ever attended a trial. Like attorneys come in with a crap ton of stuff, and they had multiple binders, and they gave the wrong binder to the judge. It was a mistake, right, but, but, and it shouldn't have it, happened. But but all it, that is is available in discovery. Well, I don't because think the they're pro- to that process yet, so he has Right, well, that's it. what I'm saying. Is that all this but, would be available at trial. But so they're jail emails, th- so the attorneys could have gotten them anyway under open records. Right, so there's no reason other than grandstanding to stand there and Correct. clutch this thing because all those documents are available to the defense. The During discovery, and of course, everybody listening to this show knows that, you can't have any secrets. All the evidence has to be available to both sides. All your witnesses have to be disclosed. Uh, they have to be uh, available to be deposed and interviewed by by the other side. All this is is available. Well, it's supposed so, to be. Prosecutors lie all the time. Well, they do, but uh, but if this you try to, this is an honest mistake. It ha- the honest mistake happened in the presence of other people. No, no, I get that. What I'm saying is, there's no reason to grasp this binder like it's like like your your life depends on it or this is the one piece of evidence it's all he had to do was hand it over and then after the hearing or ask for continuance put in a a request for discovery that that that's it or if if you saw what's in there uh go ahead and and freedom of information act send in a foia and request the information on it that's it it's just not not that damn hard not only that but the so the you know this whole debacle escalated 
because he refused to give the binder to the judge to give it to the clerk. He wanted to give it to the clerk himself and said that he wanted a chain of custody and establish on the record and just all this drama. But and and they accused the judge and the prosecutor of wrongdoing. Now, the jail emails like, first of all, are we supposed to believe that jail emails that that Marcus Wilson wrote in a jail email, yes, I meant to kill that girl and I'm glad I like are, are we supposed to believe that that kind of stuff is in there and would taint the judge's decision about the immunity hearing and therefore there's all this like convoluted just like nefarious yeah, that, malicious that's, that's, that's the Perry intent. Mason Perry Mason like, yeah. complex is yes, I did it and let me tell you why. But but the, the the idea that that is what happened here is is asinine and but if it had been here's the thing that that incident with the binder happened at like 10 till 9 this didn't come up until 10 15 when things were going south for the defense if you really felt like this was a pressing matter you should have brought it up before the hearing started and said you know before we get started we have an, we have some a concern for the court that we'd like to bring to the you know the attention of and, and and address it then. Now, of course, the judge, he comes up and says, you know, after Francis is escorted out, he says to the other attorneys that he had every intention of putting it on the record because he needed the record. He still didn't have the records that he was supposed to review. And so he needed that and he had every intention of talking about it. He should have addressed it earlier as well. But Francis set that binder on his table to hold it as like a little token of drama like a, a way out when if things weren't going well and well, that's exactly guy, what he did this guy goes right back to the crump gloria all read uh school of of law to attention whore look at me look at me look at me i'm gonna make a grand a grand gesture ah uh, he it's just a dirtbag thing to do and, and, I, and I see your notes uh, Dave reacts and shows he is equally outraged because obviously he agrees with Jessica <laughs> on this story. Yes, <laughs> well, yes I do. I mean, I mean it, it was it was a it was a good video you did. Uh, it was outside. Wendy had a fly run in front of the in front of the camera, but the content was spectacular. Uh, and it was as it not as it was happening, but immediately a, 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 as soon as you walked out and they said we're going to adjourn for lunch. Boom. Jessica's out there w- with, with the video. This is why you should follow the Georgia Virtue. This is why you should follow Jessica because it was real time reaction to what's going on. It wasn't even a reaction. You stated fact. You gave no opinion on it. You stated fact on this is what happened. And it was, it was in the moment as it's happening, not at five o'clock, not teased. This is what happened. And it, it was it was absolutely brilliant. I mean, well, not know, to not even, to completely k- kiss your ass, but well, that's okay. You can go on, but um, <laughs> but what's funny about it too is that in the morning, you know, it was just me and one TV station there, and um, maybe maybe twenty people on the defense side and ten people in the audience on the um, state side, and of course, the TV reporter had put it on Twitter and, and his Facebook as well about what happened. And I had done my Facebook live and we came back at lunch and the place was packed because everyone like more media was there, more people from the public, like suddenly, you know, these people who were too busy to attend early on, uh, wanted to be there for the drama. But, um, so you're saying you and one of the reporter have journalistic ethics and integrity. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> So we have a lawsuit in Cedartown. Mm-hmm. It is the Trey Kelly story of the week. Father of a bicyclist who died uh, following a hit and run crash in Georgia fi- has filed a wrongful death and civil rights lawsuit against the driver, as well as the state house member, Trey Kelly, and a police chief who f- the father says caused his son's death by not reporting it. It's going to be hard to prove, but. I love it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, we've got Manfred Keys, uh, who is the who's the father, su- is suing the city of Cedartown, its police department, is demanding money damages for pain and suffering, medical and funeral expenses, and compensatory and punitive damages. Now, what I find interesting about the story, Jessica, is it is in the U.S. News and World Report. Mm-hmm. 
This is not the Cedar Town shopping news. This is not, you know, a localized story anymore. This is nationwide. Sure, it hit the AP wire. And and honestly, you know, we've talked about the criminal charges and everything and, and where Trey Kelly falls in that. But this, I think, I believe, it is my opinion, that the civil route is the far more appropriate route to hold Trey Kelly accountable because, you know, we don't, we've talked about like where, where it actually became a crime for what Trey Kelly did, especially since he claims that he was the attorney. But here, like no doubt that Eric Keese is dead because it took too long. Most likely, uh, no guarantee that he would have lived. But, but he was still cri- alive. The critical hour, as 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 it's called, that critical hour after a uh, massive trauma. Uh, it, this goes back to to hell, the Civil War. The that's why field hospitals were so close to the front. The sooner you could get someone who has trauma, whether it be gunshot or anything else, the 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 more likely they are to survive. It was the whole premise behind MASH, why, why uh, mobile army surgical hospitals were so close to the front, was you could take a, a wounded soldier from the field and get them to a, to a hospital in 15 minutes instead of, instead of you know, a day. Uh, so that, I know that's more than, than what we're talking about here, but that critical hour when someone is, is injured like that it would have certainly increased his chances of living. Uh, I told you, I actually ran into Trey Kelly uh, mm-hmm. last week. Uh, and the speaker, for that matter. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Trey did not introduce himself. I, I, <laughs> uh, no? The, no, no, no. He knows who I am. He doesn't like me. Um, it's shocking. The speaker did shake my hand. He doesn't like me either. Like he saw my name tag because I, I don't, you know, we've never met before. Mm-hmm. He saw my name tag and it, it could just be his face. I don't know. But he didn't seem very genuinely glad to meet me. He was more, you know, uh, he was happier meeting Connie. Cause he probably felt sorry for her being married to such an a-hole. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that transcends everyone. No matter where you are politically, what you've done, everybody feels sorry for Connie because she has to live with me. Right. So, but I just kept thinking, uh, uh, you know, when when he was announced and stuff, he didn't he didn't speak. But would you keep your head down if all this is going on? If you had a conscience. Well, that's true. That's true. Maybe just just keep your head down. Just. Uh, I don't know. I I don't think that Kelly is criminally liable here. The driver, maybe. The Uh, driver, maybe. Of course the driver is responsible. Well, he's responsible. I don't know if he's criminally liable. Because if he says he doesn't know what he hit, there's so many things that we say, you know, the, I think it was red. The bicycle was red or something like that. And there was a red scuff and most deer don't ride bicycles. We'll have to ask Matt Lowe about that, but I don't think I've ever uh, I've ever seen a deer riding a bicycle through the woods. Not a red uh, so, one, at least. Yeah, not a red one. Yeah, they you, you typically you know red going with the with the brown coat really just clashes, and you wouldn't ride a, a red bicycle through through the through the woods. Right. Um, so there are a lot of things that that should have happened, and I don't know where 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 the criminal liability lies. I don't. I don't think the the attorney who shows up and is confused by the, by this guy who's who is uh, ranting uh, doesn't know if he hit a deer or a person. Uh, we all know that morally and ethically, you should have looked. Mm-hmm. You should have called nine one one. But I don't know what his what his responsibility is as a, as an attorney to do that. The civil thing is much more interesting because you don't need again. You don't need a a uh, a jury to come back a hundred percent to win a civil case. Uh, that's much more interesting to me. Now they're suing the driver. Also, the driver it was a bagger at I don't know, Big Star or something. 
uh, he doesn't have a whole lot to take, especially if, if he gets convicted of vehicular homicide or hit and run or whatever. You know, what are they going to take? Is 12 cents a day he makes working in the laundry? But the city, the police chief, and Kelly all have something that they that would uh, that that this father can take. And look, this father's mad, as he should and, be. Uh, anybody who's lost somebody um, unexpected like that is mad. And uh, I think that the. This is probably premature. It, uh, he should probably have let the criminal process go through before filing suit because at this point, Kelly cannot testify. The driver cannot testify. They're, they're, they're under criminal indictment. I mean, anything they say can, can go right, right over to the criminal side. So, you know, they can take the fifth. Once this is up, and they're not, you know, they're not under criminal investigation, or he's not under criminal investigation. That's a different, you know, that's a different ball game. But I'm guessing he's trying to strike while the iron's hot, while the criminal case is still in the news. Sure. It's terrible. Um, the whole thing is terrible. But I'm, you know, making their lives difficult may be the only. Uh, recourse this family ever has so and what i will what i would tell uh this father is even winning this will not make him feel better absolutely nothing right now it seems like a mission and it, it 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 sort of delays the the grieving process but it's when this goes away, if he wins $50 million or he loses, it doesn't matter. The loss is still there and he's going to have to deal with it. Uh, men in particular, we, we tend to compartmentalize and not deal with things. And we, we no. take it. We, yeah, I know. Uh, we take, we take it and, and uh, stick it in a box in our, in our brain and, and file it away. And it, it, it keeps popping up no matter what we do to shove it back in that box. It keeps popping up, and uh, you know, I, I I absolutely pray for this father. I, I empathize with this father. You know, not not having any kids, I I, I can't I, I certainly can't sympathize with with losing a losing a child. Uh, having to bury a child is is unnatural. Um, you know, you're not supposed to outlive your kids, and 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 I feel for him. I just uh, you know, I, I certainly pray for for his and his family's healing. Uh. But, uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't even know what to say. It, it, you know, it, it kind of hits close to home. You know that. Um, but, you know, I, the Trey Kelly coming out and supporting other, uh, other House members running for office, I don't think helps. No. Especially for those of us in the room that know what happened. It just makes you look like a jackass. I don't think looks like... It makes we you could, a jackass, but yeah, we can just take that out, out of the sense. And this is a good time to remind you: these are our opinions, and not those of anyone not on the show. Uh, any respective company for which we may work, own, or otherwise associate ourselves with on a regular or irregular basis. Also, you can find other episodes and relevant stories over the GeorgiaVirtue dot com. Uh, state inspectors. Uh, investigation by media outlets have found that Georgia agency unlawfully held on to millions of dollars of seized funds, spending money on Fitbits, exercise equipment, and other items. Jessica, good God. I know. I know this is going to like totally blow people's minds that um, our state government misused funds um, it was a department or a division within the Department of Revenue. And they apparently bought engraved firearms, stress balls shaped like beer mugs. Um, and this all came about. So what's interesting, I want to say something before we dive into this. So Robin Crittenden, she is the um, Department of Revenue's commissioner right now. She, I think she went in a, little, a couple months ago. But of course, you know, in per Georgia... Georgia standard we don't 
we don't bust people's balls for doing a unethical and possibly illegal we just ask them to step down and we appoint an interim commissioner and say that it, they're doing what's best for their family and they move on and robin crittenden was assigned to fill this this position um and now this inspector general report has come out that is quite lengthy and and has pretty concrete findings of of wrongdoing and to the extent that the office of the inspector general is going to like keep a watchful eye on the department of revenue for the foreseeable future even though they've already changed their policies um and i'm glad that this has all happened but like who is responsible and why are they not being held accountable this because, shows that civil yeah. asset forfeiture is not about curbing crime. It's about theft, much like taxes. Mm -hmm. It's about theft. Engraved firearms, stress balls, uh, Fitbits, fitness equipment. I mean, what did they do? Buy a Peloton? Uh. Uh, that, that, that was rhetorical. I didn't want to know exactly what fitness equipment they bought. It doesn't matter. Look, if it's in their budget to have uh, some sort of, uh, of fitness for their employees, fine. But the fact is they stole citizens' money and benefited from it directly as a department. Now, it sounds like uh, Robin Crittenton is, is above board. Like, she's coming in to clean this stuff up. And that's, hey, as, as far as for, for what we know right now, feather in her cap. Great. Clean this stuff up. What we need to clean up is civil asset forfeiture. I agree. You're right. We do. But, but listen, there were 11 allegations, and only three were found to be unsubstantiated. So... The first, they uh, they found that the Department of Revenue violated state law by failing to properly remit state asset forfeiture funds to the general fund, basically kept them for themselves. They found that the uh, personnel abused the financial crimes enforcement network by submitting a false certification that they found that Director Waits violated state procurement rules by purchasing a, two, a 2015 Ford F-250 Super Duty truck. They found that they improperly issued agency vehicles for the, personal well, use. The Department of Revenue needs a Ford F-250 super truck. The director does. I, I guess, guess it's to, to haul all up, the cash yeah, they're stealing. Exactly. Totally. Exactly where I was going with it. Um, they uh, improperly issued agency vehicles for personal use by civilian employees. Director Waits and other senior DOR professional or personnel posed for photographs on uh, furniture seized from Todd Chrisley, which we've talked about on the show, um, that a conflict of interest existed when Pippin's Barbecue, a restaurant owned by DOR Commissioner David Curry, catered the 2019 DOR Christmas party. Um, DOR failed to implement proper internal controls governing the management of a bank account created for use in, quote, undercover criminal investigations. Um, and then they the DOR failed to implement proper internal controls governing management of mobile devices. There were three other ones that were found to be um, unsubstantiated, which included um, personnel engaging in undisclosed personal relationships, um, using the funds to pay for some landscaping services, and then how they paid overtime all i'm gonna say is unsubstantiated means they didn't have evidence <laughs> like it doesn't mean they didn't do it well it, that goes back to the casey anthony thing it, it, unsubstantiated fine all right we could throw those out we still have serious serious allegations but what's going to happen uh, where's chris carr on this or is he too busy grandstanding i don't know maybe now that the report's coming out an indictment is forthcoming. I'm not sure this, uh, the investigation, a complaint was made in January of 2020 and, um, a, it, it basically, it all started because 
this attorney filed an open records request. The attorney representing the Chrisley family found some the photos and some other things when he filed an open records request. Um, and then, you know, oh, and, and you'll love this. You know, they found that the director false flight falsified an employment application and lied about his educational history. We've talked about uh, someone from the Department of Juvenile Justice doing that, who had to step down like some we and there was another one. This is common, especially in Georgia agency heads. But I mean, I'm sorry, the arrest should have accompanied the freaking report there. And this isn't just on the director. There's there's obviously way more people who have done shameful things well don't hammer too hard i got my application at nasa citing my uh, doctorate in astrophysics from georgia tech Mm -hmm. i've just been doing air conditioning as a hobby well i'm excited for you (laughs) fat man in space Uh, man uh i'm 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 happy to hear that that Crittenden is is in there, but Sony needs to be held like criminally liable for this. Uh, Chris Carr needs to get on the stick. They uh, need to seize some shit from some people to pay this money back. <laughs> well, I won't support that, but uh, they certainly they certainly conviction? need after conviction. Yes, amen, amen. Civil asset forfeiture. No, after conviction, absolutely. Well, let's get into because we're uh, we're running uh, long here. Shocking. Two, yeah, yeah, because Dave runs his mouth. Uh, two parents are suing the Georgia Department of Corrections over a transgender inmate suicide. The region's board is named because it manages Augusta University's program called Georgia Correctional Healthcare, which provides health care for inmates, including mental health care. Huh. Uh, the four defendants are the GDC, the warden at the time, Don Blakely, a, cor- a, a corrections officer, uh, James Egu, uh, and, and the George, uh, Georgia Board of Regents. And the Board of Regents, if you're wondering, like, why this university system is is part of it, they they handle um, correctional health care, like Augusta University does, so, because... You know, we, we don't give inmates quality health care. We use them as experiments and stuff. So anyway. Well, his parents uh, said in the lawsuit, they believe the prison staff knew uh, he intended to commit suicide on December 4th, 2017 and did nothing. Um, this guy was in prison or this person was in prison for uh, a 10 year sentence for robbery. Yeah. And, and I refuse to change the pronoun. Refuse. I said, yeah. I know. I know. I, I, uh, it is a dude pretending to be a chick. Mm. Uh, this totally ignores the suicide rate for tra- transgender, transgender people. People are much higher than general population. Uh well, that sh- this person was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, gender dysphoria. Right. And, and a history of hurting. Yeah. It, this itself. person had a lot of mental problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, this is a family that's hurting and is lashing out. Uh, so I don't necessarily blame the family. Uh, I, I, I don't know what... Uh, what the prison could have done besides keep him in, in solitary constantly. And uh, under, I mean, God, that'd be terrible. That'd be considered torture. So what are you supposed to do with this, with this dude? Uh, Well, some people would say you're supposed to put the, the man with the women. Yeah, if that's the case, never, never, never mind. Uh, no, no, no. I'm no. just saying because this is not the first. So we had a what you were talking in like 2015 or 16. We had a, an inmate in a state facility that was in the middle of a transition when the I forget I forget which way they were transitioning. So I'm not. I that's the reason I'm 
tiptoeing around words and stuff but the person was um in the facility like in the middle of transition and so the warden kept this person in solitary which is awful i mean i don't know what you're supposed to do but it a solitary is just an awful place no matter what and so the like the state has no parameters for what you're supposed to do. If you, if a person has, is living as a woman and has female attributes and takes female hormones and stuff, can you put that male person with the male population in a prison? I don't think you can. But you also can't put them in with the female population. I agree. So what are you supposed to do? Are we supposed I to have? I don't know. I'm just saying you can't. Are we supposed put to have persons for with LGBTQ boobs? and everything else that goes with it? I, I like Matt Lowe's uh, quote, which is, "There's only gay, straight, and 57 kinds of queer." You know, there's. What are you supposed to do here? I don't. You, know. you can't. You can't put somebody with a pecker, in with women, and you can't put a person with a hoo hoo in with a bunch of men. I, I don't care what hormones she's taking. You can't throw somebody w- with a hoo-ha into a bunch of men who already abuse each other. I mean, what do you think is going to happen to her? Exactly. That's exactly right. So I, I, a liability. I, of course it is. So I don't know what was supposed to happen with, with this dude. Uh, he already had a, a list of mental problems longer than my arm. Uh, and again, yeah, I, I, transgenderism is a, uh, is a mental illness. It, to me, it's the same as anorexia and bulimia. Uh, it's a, it's a t- sort of body dysmorphia where, you know, anorexics and bulimics believe they're fat no matter what evidence is presented to them. You know, you're 80 pounds. No, I'm fat. I'm fat. I'm fat. I'm fat. Uh, the same thing. I'm a woman. I'm a woman. I'm a woman. Yeah, your twig and berries disagree. I'm a woman. I'm a woman. I'm a woman. Yeah, that Y chromosome disagrees. I'm a woman. It's a mental illness. So I I don't know what you're supposed to do with these people. Put them in a state hospital? I have no idea. But, you know, he committed robbery by intimidation. You know, he, he got a 10-year prison sentence, was found guilty and and then he offs himself and, and look people with with the the disorders that that we listed have a much higher rate of suicide it was i don't i don't see where and look you and i are the first ones to call the jail, the jail system out mm-hmm. i don't see where the jail could have done anything else I mean, other than throw him in solitary take away take away his shoes belt and just sit and sit in a hole uh, for 10 years what the hell are you supposed so, to do apparently apparently at um the timeline is that um the correctional officer told a sergeant that mitchell intended to commit suicide and an inmate told the sergeant that mitchell was hanging in the cell and at 1 40 p.m supposedly um the They took their time walking to the cell. Uh, The correctional officer left. The sergeant stood outside the the cell door with the door open um, while the body was hanging. And then they closed it and walked away, then returned a couple minutes later, um, handcuffed Mitchell while the body was hanging, and then cut it down. Well, there's also other things that go into that and, and things that I don't know. One is if you're by yourself, you don't get yourself in a cell with an inmate, hanging or not. It, you know, could they have been hanging by their armpits and then had something around their neck and, and, and uh, to look like they're hanging, wait for a guard to come in and attack them? Uh, there's also things that you don't just rush blindly through a, a prison block. So I, I don't know that, that, that will come out. Uh, the procedures that go into that will come out. Uh, I have no idea. I've never worked in a jail, never been in jail. Uh, not yet, at least not until free speech becomes illegal, which mm-hmm. they're working on. 
so I don't know the the procedures that go into that. But I know that this family, again, like we talked about before, is hurting and they're angry and they're lashing out. Whether or not the procedures were violated with this is a, a will come out. But the fact is, you know, the the hanging himself or, or attempting to kill himself and then you know, ultimately succeeding is not unusual for people with the mental disorders that he had. So I, I, I just don't know, don't know uh, what they could have done differently. But Jessica, as we come to a close, do you have any closing thoughts? I just wanted to mention that uh, Georgia is representing on the national level in a in a in a big way. Um, there's a I think he's like nine or ten, a young Georgia boy who is representing our state in the national mullet contest. Um, not all the states are representing, of course, because not you know obviously for so many reasons I'm not even going to go into. But Georgia has a representative, so we got to root for our team. So. Here's to Georgia winning the mullet contest. Uh, I, there's no way we're going to beat out Alabama, Mississippi. <laughs> there's just no way. Uh, my final thought is selfish. Uh, Matt Lowe and I have a, have a new show. It's called Surf and Turf. Uh, one of the sponsors is the Georgia Virtue. And we're very appreciative to the, uh, for Jessica and her team at the Georgia Virtue. Uh, first show, the audio wasn't great. Matt and I hadn't done podcasting in a while second second third third uh, they drop on wednesdays uh varying times uh just depending on when the uh the software drops them uh but uh eric is the editor for that one he's doing a fantastic job audio cleaned up on two and three uh four coming up this week is a little better uh i mean they're, they're getting better the content's getting better uh, Matt knows his stuff on public lands and hunting, and and uh, uh, I have a pretty good idea of what I'm doing uh, with uh, saltwater fishing. And of course, it's a culinary. This is totally apolitical. The culinary side of it is every week we talk about a uh, a recipe. And the show that dropped last Wednesday, I talk about my fa- my favorite deer recipe, which is kind of a twist. Uh, it's it's an old family uh, lamb recipe that I that I adapted for for deer. Uh, my uh, step grandmother was. Uh, was Russian, so it's a it's a Russian lamb recipe that 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 I've adapted for for deer and it's and it's fantastic. But give us a listen, give us a rating. By the way, give us a rating on this show too. Give us five stars. Uh, interact with us on on social media. Tell us what we said, what we did wrong. Keep it to one uh, criticism a week per Jessica. So mm-hmm. for Jessica Salaji the owner of the Georgia Virtue and the brains of the operation for Eric Cumby, the person that makes us sound as good as we do because we sound much worse on the rough cut. I'm Dave Roberts. Have a great week. <laughs> <laughs>